believe that you take them. That's the word they translated. The King James translator said receive, but in the Greek it says take. Believe that you take them and you shall have them. And it's real easy to understand that verse when you understand the word take. You're not taking like a thief. You're taking from the table of the Lord set before you. See, he already gave it to you. Now think about this. I, I love the word of God because I love to meditate on the word of God. And it just seems that as you meditate on the word of God, you just see something new. And I saw something new and I loved it. I went, praise God, I saw something new. I mean, it could just be a little thing and it'll thrill me. I mean, just a little thing. I just get a little, I'm like, glory to God. Now I understand that better. I can preach it. I can live it more accurately. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And it was Ephesians 1, 3 that says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now think of this, church. He's already blessed us with every single spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Prophesied this to someone at a revive group this last Sunday night. And uh, I just feel impressed to prophesy it here too. And I just said, things are turning, they're turning, they're turning, they're turning, they're turning. You know what's turning? God's turning the faucet of blessing on. He's, he's turning it on. He's t I said he's turning it on right now. Right now. Hallelujah. The goodness of God. The goodness of God. He's turning it on. Glory to God. Now, the testimony was, that was whenever that, that revive group was, I talked to that person today, and they said, everything's just all happened at once. <laughs> Everything was like, was there before, but it wasn't happening. Now it's like everything is happening all at the same time. It's just like a, a, a bomb went off, a, a blessing bomb. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, God, God has some, high, you know, his water pressure, <laughs> his blessing pressure. He doesn't have like a, a small, he has like a water main, you know, like a giant blessing pipe. So glory to God. Don't expect little blessing. I said, don't expect little blessing. Hallelujah. Now think about this for a second. You know, the main, the main, the water main can be giant. But the pipe that makes it to your house can be, you know, a couple inches in diameter. I remember uh, about four years into us owning our house, I got a ring on the doorbell one morning. And somebody said, water's coming out of your front yard. I said, whoa. So I went outside and water was like, the, the, you know, a hole had formed in my front yard and water was like rushing out. So I ran out to the street. I turned off the water meter and I found there was a joint that had come apart and water was coming out. And it was coming out at a pretty high rate of speed, but it was just a little like two inch pipe coming to my house. Now, here's the thing I really think the Holy Ghost wants us to know is the diameter, the diameter of the pipe that makes it to you is up to you. The diameter of the blessing pipe that is flowing in your life is up to you. It's up to your thinking. If, if your thinking is small and restrictive, then you're going to have a small water pipe coming to your home, to your life as it were. But listen, if the Bible says you'll prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. So if you're thinking big, you're thinking he's a big God. He, he could make me a multi-billionaire before 12 o'clock tonight. That's the kind of God he is. Well, then you could have a big pipe of blessing coming towards you with a huge flow of blessing. And the only one that determines that is you or me, what we believe, what we believe, because I'm telling you the water main coming from heaven is huge. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's huge. It's not a small little, just bear, there isn't a little trickle. There is unlimited supply. Unlimited supply, amen? Yeah. Well, glory to God. I would, if I were you, I'd be grab, I'm grabbing a hold of that myself. I got it. It's now. I've got it now. Now, now, now. Everything in the kingdom is now. Right now. Not in 10 minutes. Not in two months. Now. You, you, you got to get it before you get it. I said, you got to get it before you get it. You get it on the inside. You get the substance on the inside, and then you'll see the thing on the outside. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God forevermore. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. 
So there's no waiting. I said there's no waiting. No waiting. Yeah, but pastor, I haven't seen it yet. That's okay. You've got it on the inside. As long as you've got it on the inside, you got it. The rest, just leave the rest in your father's hand. You'll see it in the natural very soon. As long as you keep it on the inside and you don't change, change your speech into, well, I'm, well it's going to get here pretty soon. Well, then no, it's not. Because you just, you just put it off in the future. And if you've got it in the future, you don't have it in the now. And if you don't have it in the now, it's not faith. Because now faith is. Right? Amen. Well, glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Father, we just thank you for all of your goodness. We thank you for your glory. We thank you for the help of the Holy Spirit. He's the teacher. He's the guide. He's the one who is leading us and guiding us all. Father, I just thank you for releasing truth that will help us, for releasing revelation from on high. Father, we don't need to hear from a man. We need to hear from you. So that's what we determine we're going to do. We're going to hear from you. And, and so, Father, we thank you for speaking to us this evening through your word and through your spirit. Cause us to hear the things we need to hear to cause us to apprehend all the blessings you've already given to us, Father. Thank you that all the promises of God find their yes and amen in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it's to him belongs all glory and all honor and all praise and all grace. Thank you, Father, that it's because of him we have so great of salvation. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. 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 Turn to Romans chapter 13 and verse 14. Romans 13, 14. Praise God. Now last week... We talked about weapons of victory. Weapons of victory. Do you remember that? Do you remember we have three enemies? Every believer has three enemies. The world, the flesh, and the devil. The world, the flesh, and the devil. The, the, the fight we have with the world is to not conform to the world. The, the fight we have with the flesh is to not yield to the lusts of the flesh, but to yield to the control of the Holy Spirit. The fight we have with Satan, with his kingdom, and his kingdom is a wrestling with the demonic realm for the victory Jesus has already won, but at times it will be contested and you will have to war, you will have to stand on your rights in Christ Jesus and enforce his defeat, fighting not for victory but from victory. Amen. Glory to God. Romans 13, 14. I want to expound a little bit because although I think we kind of outlined some of these weapons, we need to really know how to implement them in detail, right? Yeah. Romans 13, 14. But put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Amen. Amen. This is such a simple verse, but yet it's such a powerful weapon of victory for all of us. This verse, if we do this verse, we can be completely victorious all the time. All the time we're implementing this, we can live in victory. Right? If this gives us the opportunity. This gives us, it's so simple and yet it's so powerful what it affords us. It affords us the way to live the Christian life. And notice it doesn't say to live the Christian life, try and be real good. Do your best. Now, the other side of that coin is some people just think, well, you know, just live however you want to live. And that's crazy. And it's false doctrine. And it's darkness. And it's destruction. Right? So it's not that it doesn't say that we shouldn't strive, but there's a way we war that's different from the world. We don't do it in our own strength. Now, we still do it. But we don't do it in our own strength. That's important. Because, see, if you think it's all up to God, it isn't all up to God. You have a free will and you have a choice. However, he has empowered you to make the right choice and to live in him and to live in his power and live in his glory. Um, now, some people are called to wear clothes. We're called to wear God. I said we're called to wear God. I mean, it's good that you put on clothes, but don't forget after you put your clothes on, put God on with your clothes, right? Because if we're a Christian and we haven't put God on, we're actually going around naked spiritually, unclothed, 
I don't, I don't want to be that way to you. I want to be clothed naturally and clothed spiritually. And really, I think the natural clothing should just remind us every day when we get dressed in our natural clothes, what am I putting on spiritually? And he tells us right here, put on Jesus. Well, that, how do you do that? Anybody ever read that and go, now how exactly do you put Jesus on? This could be challenging. I may need some instruction here. <laughs> We're called to wear God. Well, we get a clue in Luke chapter 24 and verse 49. And I'm going to read from the Young's literal translation. It says, And lo, I do send the promise of my Father upon you, but you abide in the city of Jerusalem till you be clothed with power from on high. Many, many churches teach the last words of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That was not his last words. Two of the gospels record this, where he said, don't go, you're not ready yet. <laughs> Did he say that? Amen. Right here he said, what's he saying? He's saying, you're not ready. Right. You're not ready yet. Now, that, the interesting thing is, when Jesus made this statement, he's resurrected uh, from the dead. He's appeared to the disciples after his resurrection, he's even breathed on them. I think that's in the book of John and said, receive ye the Holy Spirit. So that was the new birth that they received. But he said, you're still not ready. You're born again and you're still not ready for, for what I've got you to do. You're not ready to face life. You're missing something. What are you missing? He says, wait, tarry, wait in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued or clothed with power from on high. Amen. Glory to God. In other words, we are not called to be natural people. We are not called to be well-educated, gracious, slick people. That's fine and good. All that, that doesn't hurt you, but that doesn't bring people into the demonstration of God's kingdom that he longs to demonstrate in people's lives. No, he's called us to be supernatural people. Supernatural people. You know, there really should be no question as to which religion is true because if Christians had been taught from the beginning the doctrine the Apostle Paul taught in the epistles, the church would be so different today. The church would be full of people that could produce miracles at will. At will. At will. Not later. Not, well, let me pray for you and we'll see what God will do. Now, wait a minute. That's not scriptural. It's not really scriptural for you to pray for somebody to be healed. We've only got one verse in the New Testament about that. That's James 5. After the Gospels, after the resurrection. Right? We've got one verse about that. Now, the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every verse, every word be established. No, we've got to understand we are a carrier of God. God is in you and God is in me. And so you are not called to ask the Father to do what He's already told you to do. He has told you to heal the sick, cast out devils, raise the dead. Now, how am I supposed to do that? And He answers the question. This is in the Matthew 10. You can look it up later. Freely you have received freely give. Now, if you're watching the book of Acts, I've noticed this. Here's where prayer comes in. Like before Jesus or before Peter raised uh, one, one person from the dead, he stopped before he, he ministered to them and he prayed. He knelt beside the bed and he prayed. What was he doing? He was getting in the spirit. He was getting fired up. Maybe he'd gotten a little drier. He'd He'd, he'd given out so much, he was getting a little dry. So what was his prayer doing? He was getting a quick charge up of the power of God to release the power of God. Now, it doesn't say he prayed for the person to be raised from the dead. He prayed to get full of the Holy Ghost, full of the power. Then he released the power. Because he's the one that said, such as I have, give I thee. Now, if you don't know better, you'll think this is arrogance. It's not arrogance. It's fulfilling the will of God, doing what Father told us to do, doing what Jesus did. Jesus didn't pray for the sick. Check it out. I did an in-depth study of the ministry of Jesus. I couldn't find where he prayed for the sick. He told people how to release their faith to get their miracle. 
Kind of like, you know, when the, the four crazy friends had the guy sick of the palsy and they took the chainsaw to the roof of the church and they went and cut that sucker open, right? And they let him down right in front of Jesus and Jesus prayed for him. No, he didn't. He said, man, thy sins be forgiven thee. Oh, wow. Can you imagine if a preacher said something like that? But Jesus said, man, thy sins be forgiven thee. And, the, of course, the, the minds of the scribes and the Pharisees are going tilt now. How dare you? you this is Mark chapter 2. You can't forgive sins. Who do you think you are? Now, none of them said that, but Jesus perceived their thoughts through a word of knowledge. He perceived what they were said. And he said this. He said, I'm going to really mess with them. I love Jesus. He loved messing with religious people. He just loved just taking their theology and upending it. And I'm telling you, some of us need our theology upended and need to get into the reality of being a New Testament believer and not live like you're under the old covenant. Live like you're under the new covenant and live out of the things that he has freely given to you and learn how to use the weapons of your warfare and crush the works of the devil. For what did Jesus do? He went about doing good and healing all those that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him and I'm here to tell you God is with you and God is with me and we can do the very same things. But it will only happen if we're taught that and we see it demonstrated and then we begin to operate in it. Why was it so easy for the apostles to demonstrate God's kingdom? Why were miracles no big deal? You know, the baptism of the Holy Ghost was a big deal to them, but miracles were not a big deal. They had never seen anybody filled with the Holy Ghost. Matter of fact, Philip went down to Samaria and preached Christ. He had uh, epileptics healed, those sick of the palsy healed, devils coming out of all kinds of people, right? He had all these miracles. They all got, so people got born again, got water baptized, but for some reason he couldn't get them filled with the Holy Ghost. So he calls for the apostles. Peter and John come from Jerusalem. They come down and they lay their hands on these people. They've been saved. They've been washed in the blood. They've been water baptized. And the Holy Ghost begins to come on everybody the apostles are laying hands on. And Simon the sorcerer says, wow, I want, how, can, how much will it cost me to get this power these apostles have where they lay hands on people and see, these, see them filled with God? Yeah. See, that was, to, in their mind, that was the great miracle. Now, obviously, Simon was way off, and that's not the subject of what we're talking about. But see, the disciples, which became the apostles, had been with Jesus three and a half years, day and night. And they saw every kind of thing healed you can imagine. And we think we've got a big picture of the life of Jesus. We don't. I said, we don't. Do you know if you take away like Jesus' birth and crucifixion and just the little, the, you know, 12 years old in the temple and some of the other stuff, what you're left with is a snapshot of 18 days of the ministry of Jesus. 18 days. And the New Testament, the Gospels, are packed with miracle after miracle after healing after miracle after this and that and the other. He walked on the water and he translated a ship full of him and the disciples. And he, you know, every, he rebuked the storm and all these things he did. It's 18 days. John said if all the, if books were written to contain everything he did, the world itself wouldn't be able to contain them all. So we just get a little tiny glimpse into how glorious Jesus' ministry was. Do you know after you've seen 50 people raised from the dead, you probably could just pray at will for the dead to be raised, and, you know, because you would actually see the word come to pass? Now, just seeing things, it doesn't produce faith. But what reinforces your faith is you hear it, you believe it, and you see it. And there's been where the disconnect has been because religion will say God used to heal. God someday will heal, but don't put somebody sick in front of me now because I don't know what will happen. That's religion. Jesus wasn't religious. <laughs> Matter of fact, whenever he heard about somebody sick, he's like, bring them to me. It's like taking candy from a baby, right? This is easy, piece of cake. Yeah, no big deal for Jesus, right? And yet you're made in his likeness and in his image, have the same spirit. For this purpose, the Son of God or uh, the Son of God went about doing good and destroying all the works of the devil. 
He, Jesus destroyed, 1 John 3, 8, he destroyed the works of the devil. Yeah, right. Everything the devil was creating and doing, Jesus destroyed it. Well, did Satan create sickness and disease? Yes. 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 Luke uh, chapter 13 talks about, ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these 18 years be loose from this bond on the Sabbath day. That, that was a spirit of infirmity that woman had. She was bowed over and couldn't even lift her head up. That's a spirit of infirmity. That's a demon of sickness. Demon of sickness. Some sicknesses are caused by natural diseases, but some sicknesses are called by, caused by demons. And Jesus would cast the spirit out and people would be healed. Or he would lay hands on them and release the power, and they would be healed. So, and we know Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all those that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Question, is God with you? Is he with you? If he's with you, then I would say that same God with you that was with Jesus can do the same things through you that he did through Jesus. If we can just learn to yield, to believe, and to cooperate with him. And it all starts with your teaching. If you're not taught right, you know, you're never going to believe this. You're going to believe religious lies. That you have no power, that you can't do anything. No, God put his power in you. I said, God, this is Luke 24, 49. Did, what did Jesus say? He said, wait until you have power. Say that with me. I, I need to wait until I have power. When I get filled with the Holy Ghost, I have the same power Jesus had. That's it. That's it. But why have we not believed that? Why do we act like that's not true? Why are we praying for revival when we should live in revival every second? I said live in revival. Live in the reality of him on the inside. Live in the reality of him on the inside. All the time, he's on the inside. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Oh, I just need to get prayed up. Well, get prayed up, praise God, and then, and then and stay prayed up. But he's in you. <laughs> he's in you all the time. Well, did you forget about Mark chapter 2? No, I didn't forget about Mark chapter 2. Let's spin around there. Mark chapter 2. So Jesus said, hey, What's easier? Now I'm paraphrasing. What's easier? To say, man, your sins be forgiven you? Or to say of these sick of the palsy, rise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. I say of these sick of the palsy, rise and take up your couch and go your way to your house. Or I think the King James says, rise, take up your bed and walk. And what happened to him? He rose. He picked up his couch. That's a big old couch. No. <laughs> I guess it wasn't a sleeper sofa. He, <laughs> Praise God. He rose, he took up his couch, and he went home. And, of course, all the religious people said, how did he do that? How did he do that? How could he do that? Amen. Jesus did it. But, see, Jesus is telling us to preach the same gospel. He's telling us to preach to people that Jesus bore your sins. And Jesus bore your sicknesses on the cross. And because of what he did for you, you can go free. You can go free from your pain. You can go free from spiritual death. You can, you can forsake hell and inherit heaven and have eternal life now and know that you're a son of God now. Know that you have eternal life now. now know that you have joy unspeakable now. Live out of the provision of heaven now. The riches, the glory of heaven his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. His riches, his riches. Everybody say his riches. His riches. Where are his riches? In glory. His riches are in glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But I'm telling you, the glory is in us. The glory is in us. The glory of God is in every believer who will receive the glory of God and walk in that glory of God. Hallelujah. And just live in His presence. Live in His glory. Live pursuing Him and seeking Him and hungering for Him and thirsting for Him. 
The Bible says in Romans 5, 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Hallelujah. What does that mean? That means every day, every second, the glory of God is ours to enjoy. It's ours to enjoy. That's why, in, how do I enjoy that glory of God? Well, be being filled with that glory. How do I be being filled? Well, Ephesians 5.18 talks about that. And be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. In other words, there's so many Christians today that don't know what the will of the Lord is. What is the will of the Lord? It's to not be unwise, but to be wise. How can you be wise? Well, see, immediately to be wise, we think it's how we think. But Jesus crushes that paradigm because he says it's not how you think, it's how you drink. And be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And then he goes on to say, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled, be filled with the Spirit. And of course, we know in the Greek there's a play on the words that says, to be being filled. To be being filled. You know, and we see that this is so vital to our Christian walk. We are not, because we're called to live supernatural lives, I mean, we're called to be led by the Spirit, not by reason. We're called to do miracles, to look the impossibility in the eye and prophesy the word of the Lord to impossibilities. How does that work? Well, if you're dealing with sickness in your body, you're called to look right at that sickness and command that sickness to leave in Jesus' name. That's unreasonable unless you've got something greater than sickness. But you do. We do. His name is Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ. He's greater than sickness. So we're called to live an unreasonable life, not to be held back by reason. Now, all the world around us lives by the mind of sense and reason. We know in Romans 8, 6 in the Amplified, I believe it is, it says, the mind of sense and reason is death, death that comprises all the miseries of sin, both here and hereafter. So if I live my life out of reason and you live your life out of reason, and that's the end of the day, that's what it's all about is reason. We're going we're gonna to be miserable. So many Christians are trained this way. They're not trained in the supernatural. They're not trained to speak the word of God to the impossibility. You are the prophet of your own life, of your own destiny, and of your own future. If you if, Take a look around at your life. If you're not happy with it, check out what you've been saying. Your life will never rise above the level of your own confession. Your faith will never rise above the level of your confession. In other words, your confession will, will create a lid on the life that you live. People say things that, that create a lid on their life and stop their progress in God many times. And so if you don't like what's going on in your life, check out what you've been saying and then make an adjustment and begin to say what God said. Because unlike us, God's thoughts are unlimited. God doesn't think little. <laughs> I mean, I'm telling you, he doesn't think little. I mean, if the, the universe is 26, 28 billion light years across, and we have no way to even possibly understand how humongous that is, I mean, there's, there's just no way to wrap around it. I mean, if, if you think about if, okay, if, if a seagull landed on a shore of the beach, and took one grain of sand and flew from one end of the universe to the other and, and did that over and over and over until they, they moved the earth, one day, it would not be one day in eternity. 